Laura's every week. Um, so just to say uh, thank you for inviting me here tonight, um, and uh, in particular to Tony uh, for asking me to speak. Um, this is the first talk I've ever given about manuscript collections of the genealogical office. I hope it won't be the last. Um, we shall see. Um, so what I really want to talk about um, was I'll talk a little bit about the development of, of heraldry and the development of heraldry in Ireland, and then I'm going to talk about the, the main record sets in the collections of the genealogical office. Um, so they're generally divided into two. So there's the official records that were that the uh, Ulster's office was obliged to keep, and then there's also a series of genealogical kind of research material that sort of uh, evolved mainly due to Sir William Beetham in the in the 19th century. Um, so Mike the Knight, uh, if any of you have children or grandchildren, you will recognise uh, Mike the Knight. Um, the Office of Arms was established in February 1552 by Edward VI um, as a means of regulating the use of heraldry in Ireland. Um, it's now called the Office of the Chief Herald. Um, it's the oldest office of state in Ireland. It basically continues in, in an unbroken line from 1552. Um, Right, so the origins of heraldry, um, the practice of heraldry emerged in Western Europe in about the 12th century when knights began to use um, devices on their shields to identify themselves in battle and at tournaments. During the 13th century, arms began to be painted onto the knight's linen surcoats, and that's where you get the term coat of arms. Um, over time, arms began to be passed from father to son and the deployment of arms evolved from being for purely mar uh, martial use to civil use, and um, particularly, say, on seals for authenticating documents. Um, all of these developments um, contributed to um, um, the, the concept of heraldry as hereditary, and if there also developed a technical vocabulary to describe um, arms. Um, by about the year 1300, there were 1,500 coats of arms um, in use in England, um, but there was no legal control over their use. Um, in the 14th century, heralds um, began to make judgments where disputes of arms arose. Um, and in the following century, specific names and titles were given to heralds. So that's where you get the Garter, King of Arms. You get the Clarence O. Herald, Norris Herald, Lancaster Herald and are names that are actually still in use today in the College of Arms in London. Um, since the right to bear arms depended on one's antecedents, um, the practice of heraldry became associated with genealogists, or genealogy, and heralds actually became genealogists, in addition to the Romans heralds. Um, so in Ireland, Um, heraldry was in formation at the time of the Anglo-Norman invasion, um, and the heraldry of Anglo-Norman Ireland developed in a similar manner to the heraldry, uh, development of heraldry in, in feudal Europe. And many great Norman lords held property in England and Ireland and would have used arms that originated in England. The situation in the Gaelic families um, was different. So warfare in Ireland didn't um, evolve or didn't evolve around knights and vassals factors which contributed to the development of heraldry um, in England. And Gaelic families didn't use hereditary succession, um, but instead they used a, an election system called Thornistry. Um, so these factors really delayed the widespread use of heraldry among Gaelic families. Now, this all changed um, in Tudor Ireland, so Henry VIII, um, who, when he I suppose became king, or king of Ireland uh, rather than Lord of Ireland in 1541. He attempted to and really succeeded in establishing a new or tried to establish a new political order. Um, it was here we began to see Gaelic chiefs using heraldic devices for the first time. So during the, the 16th century, many great Irish families, so the O'Neills, the O'Donnells, McCarthy's, and O'Briens, who accepted peerages as part of the, the policy of surrender and regrant, um, actually started using arms. Um, and also they also accepted the, the principle of lineal descent in the main line. So both of, of those, the surrender and regrant, um, and the, well, the acceptance of peerages, and also um, um, accepting the principle of lineal descent in the main, in the main line, actually helped um, establish heraldry among those families. 
Um, so this is the first record set that I want to talk about, and um, the records of the Irish nobility. Um, I haven't found a huge amount about them, they're actually wonderful, the series. Um, so in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, so two Ulster king, kings of arms, Christopher Usher and Daniel Molyneux, began to compile records of arms in use um, among the Irish nobility, including Gaelic peers. So Gaelic arms are, um, or arms of Gaelic peers, they're often quite distinctive and they incorporate um, sort of you know, features that would be obviously Gaelic. For example, the dexter hand, dexter is right, sinister is left, um, the sacred tree, the salmon, the serpent, um, the boar, the stag, and so on. So I have a number of examples of, of these arms that were in use during this time. Um, so there you see, I mean, I'm sure you all know it, it's the, the red hand um, of Hugh O'Neill. Um, the dexter hand is a particular um, symbol is representing the Celtic sun god, um, and also um, it, it also has a religious symbolance or a, a religious significance from the right hand of God. So we have two more here. So McCarthy, um, so you have McCarthy Moore, Earl of Plancarthy in Valencia on the left, and then you have arms granted to Charles McCarthy, Viscount Musbury, and Baron of Blarney um, in 1639. So these arms display the Irish symbol of the stag, again, very common in Irish mythology. Um, two other ones here, so one Irish family, one Norman. Um, so you have O'Donnell on the left, and the hand holding the Passion Cross, again, is another symbol that's quite distinctive to Irish heraldry, or Gaelic heraldry. And then the Fitzgerald arms on the right. Um, you'll notice that the Fitzgerald arms, the description is actually, this is what we call a, a blazon, so this is a description in heraldic language of the, the, of the shield. Um, it, it's, uh, what is it, um, Argent Saltire Ghoul. So Argent is silver, so it, it rep is represented as white. Saltire is the cross and ghouls is red. Um, the, the simplicity of that shape indicates that it, it evolved when heraldry was in formation because it's so simple. And you'll see that heraldry has become more complex as time has gone on. Um, you'll, you'll, the, I, I use the Fitzgerald, or the Fitzgerald arms quite a lot in some of them, so just look out for the, the Argent um, assault ghouls as you go through. Um, right. and two other methods were used to check um, the use of arms in Ireland. So you have visitations and funeral entries. So visitations took place between about 1568 and 1610, there are only three of them, um, took place mainly in locations in the Pale, so mainly Dublin, areas around Dublin and Wexford. Uh, there's only, only three of them ever took place, so they recorded arms in use. Um, and you can see the example there I have is Hoare of Parkhurst Town in, in Wexford. And they, they actually provide quite, the, the narrative provides quite a lot of genealogical information about the, the armagers, so the people described in the visitations. Um, because the visitations were not hugely successful, because there were only three of them and they only covered areas really within the Pale, um, the next record series that the heralds took on were, were funeral entries. So this is was a policy of recording arms of deceased armagers and their family details, so the date of death <coughs> when they were buried who they married and who their children were. Um, and they're really, really interesting. So this, this is not a, a, a arms, this is a picture um, from the title page, it's one of the volumes um, from the female entries and I think it's, I really, really like that image. Um, um, so this is the entry for the funeral of the Earl of Kildare from 1595. Um, you can see the Fitzgerald arms again. Um, so Argent uh, Saltar ghouls displayed in a variety of ways. So you can see the shield, which you all know. The tabard is the, the item that looks like a dress. The pennon is the kind of pointy flag. And then you have uh, the banner is kind of the square flag. 
So they're the art, they, they are supposed to depictions of the Fitzgerald arms in a variety of ways. And then the, the writing at the side, sorry, it's quite difficult to read, that has some genealogical information <coughs> on him, um, about his wife and his, he had two daughters, one of whom married into the O'Donnells. Um, more funeral entries. So some of the earlier funeral entries, very colourful, and you see drawings of funeral processions and so on. A lot of the later entries look like this. So you have um, multiple entries on a page. You have um, kind of just drawings of the arms, and then a sort of a small, kind of a short narrative about the the the, the armature who died. <coughs> Um, the second entry on the left, you can see Right Honourable Donna O'Brien. So again, um, if you look at the left-hand side of the shield, um, you'll see it has three red lines. Okay, they're the O'Brien arms. And anyone with an eagle eye will see that they look quite similar to the royal arms of England. And they have, that was, the, the O'Briens took those arms as a way of declaring their loyalty to the crown. Um, the arms on the right hand side of that particular shield are the Fitzgerald arms and Donna O'Brien is actually married to a Fitzgerald and that's what's called a pain where you have two, two arms on the same shield. Um, you can see the entry on the bottom right hand side is for Thomas Coakley of, of Tintern in Wexford and that actually is quite a lot of information on him and his family. Um, more coloured funeral entries, this time these are for ladies. Um, so the one on the right hand side is Rose Usher. Generally arms were uh, granted and held by uh, ladies on what they call a lozenge, which is the diamond shape. Um, we no longer issue arms to ladies on a lozenge, but I know that they still do in the College of Arms in London, which I think is interesting. Um, so you can see the arms on the left hand side, again you can see the three, this is the wife of the Donna O'Brien who we met on the previous page. So you can see, I suppose, a clearer image of the three lines of O'Brien and the, the saltire, the red, the, the red uh, saltire from uh, Fitzgerald. Then on the bottom, again it's another lady and the, the arms are Sutton and Latin, she was a Latin, her husband was a Sutton and the arms have been impaled. Now, registered pedigrees. Um, during the 17th century, the whole of Ireland was brought within the social and political framework of English society. Most Irish nobility and gentry attempted to adapt to this new order, but many fled to continental Europe after the Crom Cromwellian and Williamite confiscations. For these Irish families, evidence of their gentle or noble status was critical for advancement in their new homelands. In the 18th century France, degrees of nobility were rigidly fixed and all but the highest ranks were excluded from court. Proof was required that a candidate's family had been noble for at least 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the descendants who followed James II into exile at the court of Saint-Germain in France looked for coats of arms and attested pedigrees as evidence of the noblesse. Uh, James Terry, who was the Apollon president um, at the Office of Arms, actually fled to France taking the seal of office and a number of documents with him. And he continued to issue um, grants and uh, certificates of arms to many Jacobite exiles, along with a number of scholars, including Charles Linegar and Roger O'Farrell. With Terry's death in 1725 and the decline of the Stuart Court in exile after 1745, emigrants needed a new source of proof of their status, and the number of registered pedigrees for Irish emigrants increased steadily throughout the 18th century, particularly after the 1840s. The series of registered pedigrees in the office continues to the 1940s and covers both Gaelic and Anglo-Irish families. So the pedigrees are in, along with many other documents in the genealogical office collections, they're in a variety of styles, um, from certificates with a uh, full kind of narrative um, text. There's some pedigree charts, there's some coloured pedigrees, there's some transcripts of patents, there's some in Latin, some in English, so it's anything and everything. Um, but they're a, a brilliant source for researching um, the wild geese, basically. Um, so this is an example, um, it's quite
quite difficult to read actually, but I'll just tell you. Um, so it's a, a certificate issued by um, William Hawkins, who was Ulster King of Arms, 1773, to a Captain Barry of the Regiment of Bavaria in the French service, recording that Garrett is descended from Edmund Barry and his wife Eleanor. So Eleanor was the daughter of James Butler, Baron Don Boyne, and Edmund Barry himself is the fourth son of James Barry, who's was Viscount Butland, title created in 1561. So I'd be interested to know if this uh, met the, uh, the criteria for the, his, to continue his, uh, his career. Um, this is um, another registered pedigree. I just really wanted to show, I suppose, the, the variety of um, items within this series. Um, so this is a registered pedigree of the Earls of Thomond. Um, it's quite detailed. Um, there is a note, that narrative piece, or the textual piece in the middle, to say that Dunna, the second Earl of Thomond, was actually murdered by his brother um, because he had took the earldom of Thomond and had entailed it on his male heirs. However, it all turned out, I think, quite happily in the end because his son and grandson did actually inherit and then it passed to a cousin. Um, it's an example from an Anglo-Irish, or sorry, um, an Anglo-Irish family, so <coughs> the of East Hall in Chester. Starts in about the 14th century and goes up to the 18th century. Um, and some members of the family, um, for example, Thomas Lee, was actually killed in Ireland in 1637. And then his descendants settled in Dublin, Louth and Meath. And one of his grandsons was actually killed at the siege of Drogheda. So that's all recorded in this pedigree. Um, in addition to their armorial and genealogical duties, the Ulster King of Arms, was an, as an officer of the Crown, also played an important role connected with Crown administration in Ireland. So from 1698, um, Ulster kept uh, an official list of Irish peers. So Irish peers who were entitled to sit in the Irish House of Lords and then after the Act of Union, Irish peers who were entitled to sit as representative peers for Ireland in, in the House of Lords in Westminster. Uh, before a new peer could be admitted, either on the basis of the creation of a new peerage or by succession because he followed someone who died, um, he had to provide information on the title, the family history and the arms. So these are a record. Um, these records form a series called the Lord's Entries and um, the importance of these records I suppose is that they continue in an unbroken line right up to 1939. Um, you'll find quite a few um, even during the 1920s, so after partition and so on, the office still continued to grant arms from the Crown and that only changed in 1943 when it passed to the Irish state. Um, so the the second set of records in this series are baronets' records, really established to correct and prevent abuses in baronets, people claiming that they were barons when they weren't and so on. Um, Starting in 1789, records go up to about the 1810s. Um, again, they vary in their content. Uh, they can contain a transcription of the original patent with uh, a pedigree and the arms. Um, this is quite an early one, it's Sir Anthony Brabazon Baronet and you have the text of his um, patent making him a baronet um, and then his arms there and then there's actually, um, the next page is actually a, a pedigree chart but it only has him filled in. I'm going to show you another kind of much later example. Um, so it's a fa very famous family um, and I'm interested to see that Constance Markovich um, and her sister Eve Gore Booth were both in this, so this is the baronet records of the, of the Gore Booth family. Um, the most important, I would say, and, uh, and most valuable collection of records in the office, um, and which we continue, um, is the collection of grants and confirmations of arms. So arms were granted um, from the founding of the office. Our register of grants and arms only begins in about the 1690s, um, but it does continue to the present day, and we still issue and, and grant arms, grants and arms confirmations. Um, because arms are hereditary, they tend to contain um, genealogical information on the grantee, particularly in the case of confirmations. Um, confirmations um, are where there is no record of the original grant, um, but a person can show that arms have been in use by his family for three generations and they tend to contain a lot more information 
um, than just a normal grant. Um, so next couple of slides will show some images of different uh, grants. So these are two images from the earliest books um, and you'll see how they, they differ from the later images. Um, so the, the image on the left is actually the very first page that we have in GOMS 103, which is the first um, book that we have. Um, so you can see they have, um, it's just, they're just drawings of the arms um, with then the, the name of the, the grantee and um, the date. And then some of them um, have a little bit more genealogical information. And then the one on the right hand side um, again, colour with some more information on the grantee and the, the date of the grant. Um, but you can see how when I said that um, Norman Anglo or Norman heraldry or from the evolution of heraldry is quite simple and now you can see it evolving and there's quite a lot of devices in use and quite a lot of colours in use and symbols in use and so on. Um, this is a really nice document. Um, it is um, do, do, do. Sorry, uh, sorry. It's John Petty. Uh, so it's a record of a grant of arms to John Petty, who's Baron Duncarran and Viscount Fitzmaurice, and it shows the quartering. So you can see on the shield, um, you can actually see that the first and second, the first and fourth quarters, um, are uh, Fitzmaurice, and the other two are Petty. And his, he was the second son of Thomas Fitzmaurice, Earl of Kerry and his mother was a daughter of William Petty, so, well, daughter and sole heir, so he was entitled to quarter um, the Petty arms with the arms of Fitzmaurice. Now, this is, um, this I suppose shows you the evolution of the records that were kept at the office. So, um, William Beetham really put the, the record keeping in the office on a sound footing and you can see it in terms of the, the records that were kept, and I suppose particularly in the, the, his own genealogical research and so on. So this is an example from one of the, the sort of early, 18, early 19th century um, grant books. So you can see, you know immediately that it's a grant to a woman because of the lozenge. And um, it's actually quite a lot of, of um, I won't read the story out, but suffice to say, um, that it's a grant of arms to um, a woman called uh, Marianne, um, who uh, she, she was Marchioness of Wellesley. Um, she's actually de descended from an O'Carroll, um, who left Ireland and was granted 60,000 acres in Virginia um, because his estates had been confiscated. Um, and she's now applying, she can prove her lineage, it's all in the document, and now she's applying to bear the O'Carroll arms and that her heirs will as well. So this, I suppose it shows you the, 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 the use that you can make from the information in, in these grants. Um, this is um, a grant from Neville Wilkinson, and I really liked this volume in particular because I think you can see sort of arts and crafts movement um, showing up in the heraldry. A lot of those, the shields tend to be um, on their side rather than, than straight up. And this is a grant, again, you can see quarterings in it. It's actually a grant um, to a man called Loftus. He was actually a Murphy, changed his name to Loftus um, uh, to, because he was in, inheriting um, a particular estate and he has quartered the arms of Loftus um, with Murphy. And there's, there's quite a long story in, in the, that arms as well about how this was taking place and the descent and so on. Um, this is a modern grant of arms. So you can see it doesn't look hugely different from uh, one that was done 100 years ago. Um, so we continue to grant between, I'd say, 12, maybe 10 and 14 a year. Um, to issue grants and confirmations and certificates of arms as well. Um, so this is one to uh, a man, um, Morris Fitzgerald, who lives in um, Alabama. Uh, he's a grand, great grandson of a man from Fitzgerald from Curlis. So that's documented in the, in the grant text. Um, most, or I would say, a, a substantial <laughs> proportion of the applications for a grant of arms that we get 
um, are from the diaspora, so mainly people in the, from the US um, and from Australia. Although Irish, uh, I, there is, uh, I suppose, a steady proportion of Irish people who apply for grants and loans every year. Um, right, so now that we've talked about um, the official records, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the um, the research material. So material that was collected and generated um, not because of an official function but to aid the, the business of the office. Um, the, the first one um, which was it's created, they're all sort of created by Sir William Beacon who started this policy. He was also King of Ireland between 1820 and 1853 and he started this policy as a genealogist and he started this policy of gathering in and creating um, genealogical um, records I suppose to help the office and that policy was continued by his predecessors. Sometimes you'll pick a volume of beat them out and you'll find writing from later you might find you know sadder annotation or so on so they actually corrected the records as they went on as well as adding to them. Um, Probably the most important of this research material are Beatham's Will Abstracts. So they're abstracts from the prerogative wills um, from 1536 to about 1800. Um, so I know you don't need to, I don't need to tell you about the importance of wills for family historians and the, the depth and the breadth of information that they can contain. Um, and you also know that wills were administered through the Church of Ireland until about 1857-58. Um, wills that uh, with estates valued at more than five pounds and in two or more dioceses had to be administered through the, the prerogative court of the Archbishop of Armagh. Um, what, um, what Sir William Beetham did was he looked at the wills and then he abstracted the family information from him. So he, there are two series of records that, uh, that one is the, the notebooks that he did the research in there in the National Archives, but the will abstracts, so this is the abstract of information you can actually find if we have all those records in the genealogical office. Um, Sir Arthur Vickers, who was a later Ulster King of Arms, actually published an index to the wills in, in the list, and that's quite useful if you're looking for a particular family. Um, I have a close-up here. So this is just an example of the information. Um, they're not pretty, um, but the information in them you're not going to find, you may not find anywhere else, um, because the wills were destroyed. Um, so. Um, we have, so you have a Latin, it's very hard to see because it's actually written, it's annotation, Hansel who married a Jane Alcock and their children, so you have George, you have Alice, you have Christian, you have Jane, Begnet, which is a name that comes up quite a lot, um, and Mary, and you have details about um, who, who they married. And then you have George who married... Uh, Catherine and Farrell, you have obviously her brother was mentioned in the will because you have Ambrose Farrell who's in as a brother-in-law and then you have their children so you have Patrick Latin, you have Ambrose um, who was in the Austrian army and was living in Zell in Germany um, and then you have Mary, you have Jane, you have Begnet again and then you have Anne and all of that information you can see some of the dates so you can see um, Alice Latin will approved 1735. Um, you can see Ambrose Latin will approved 1788. So they're constantly gathering information about the families and looking at all of the family relationships. And um, the the last set of records that I want to talk about just very briefly are, are the other records. So the prerogative wills, uh, will abstracts were taken from a single source. Beetham also compiled um, four other series of records, so created from a number of sources. So you, the sketch pedigrees, I have an example, um, Anglo-Irish pedigrees, the pedigrees of Anglo, but I think they're officially called ancient Anglo-Irish pedigrees, so pedigrees of Anglo-Irish families, Milesian families, and Linea Antiqua. Um, Linea Antiqua, I don't know if anybody's <coughs> familiar with it, they're the genealogies of the Gaelic families. 
um, and they were used as source information for Edward MacLeod's book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, you know that. Um, so you could do you could do a whole other talk on any one of those. Um, so and this is an image from the sketch pedigrees. It's actually of um, Mansfield. I picked Mansfield in Latin because that's a, a family that is from an estate collection that I worked on. And um, that, to my knowledge, is the only record of the Mansfield Arms. Um, and there, there is an entry in Burke's General Armoury to say that those arms were allowed um, in 1830, but that is the only record of those arms anywhere in the office that I have found so far. So don't, if you're looking for arms related to a particular family, don't just look in the Grand Series, you need to look in a few other places as well, is what I would say. Um, and then I have a few other, just if you're interested in further reading, the Irish Mines Good Commission Guide to the Genealogical Office, Dublin, 1998, is really good. It reprints an article um, by John Brennan from Facing Your Irish Ancestors, I think the first edition, um, where he talks about the main record sets. And there's also a listing of all the manuscripts. Um, Simple Heraldry, cheerfully illustrated, um, Michal's uh, Oakmont's Pulpa book of Irish Heraldry. And then, if you're really interested in heraldry, uh, you could look at the General Armoury as well, and that's actually available online. Okay. okay, well, so thank you very much.